In this presentation, we'll talk about multi-technology design. This is part one of a multi-part series in which we'll explore some of the challenges of multi-technology design and how the AWR design environment uh, very uniquely addresses these design challenges. So we'll start off by looking at what is multi-technology design. Uh, typically, if you were to look at a top-down view of a design, you might see something like this, where you have multiple ICs uh, connected to each other through uh, various traces. Uh, it becomes a little bit more apparent when we look at this in cross-section, what's going on here. Uh, you have a chip maybe designed in one technology, let's say it's silicon, that needs to communicate with a chip designed in another technology, let's say it's a uh, gallium arsenide HBT process, and we may or may not need to go through packaging, but there's some other interconnect technology that uh, the dye are bonded to as well as being connected through. Additionally, we may have bonding technology such as bond wires or flip chip, which are connecting the dye to whatever medium is supporting them. Uh, this is a very complex design situation. Just in this example right here, we can see that uh, potentially we're talking about four or five different technologies. Now, typically the way people design in these technologies is they choose a tool that's uh, optimized or uh, specialized for that technology. So you may have uh, a PA, uh, an HBT PA being designed in one tool, um, simulation being done in one tool, layout being done in another tool, and the PHEMP switch, let's say, if this is a, a front-end module for a handset, may be designed in a similar uh, suite of software. But when we come to the silicon, that may be designed in its in its own software or in software that's just uh, more layout driven, let's say. Uh, there's many tools involved in this flow. When we get to the PCB or the module, which is more of a laminate or PCB type technology, um, we may switch to a totally uh, different environment. Uh, there may be another a fifth tool involved when we try to do uh, a full up EM of the, of the uh, design um, and bring it all together. So we have many tools, uh, disparate, not really uh, meant to work with each other, uh, but moreover we have simulation versus layout tools. Uh, there's no real um, integration, if you will, or, or, or um, uh, automation that's working together in concert. Uh, one other problem that you may see if you kind of go uh, one layer deeper into this flow is that when we get to this step over here where we have the PCB and module, um, we're trying to design the entire module, if you will, in a single step. In other words, we're going to try to co-simulate all these individual blocks, perhaps uh, netless sub-circuits being brought together with uh, a very high multi-port count EM analysis representing the metal on the module. Uh, we're going to bring all that together into the um, into a single simulation and try to co-simulate the des design. Um, while in fact this is a co-simulation uh, problem where we need to load, let's say, uh, models for a HBT process, models for a PHEM process, silicon models, models for a laminate or packaging uh, technology. This co-simulation is very important, but it's important to understand that this is not co-design. Uh, co-simulation is precisely what it says. We're doing the electrical simulation, but we're not able to make trade-offs, um, let's say, at the system level because we're doing a circuit simulation, or we're not able to make trade-offs at the, at the layout or, um, or manufacturing verification level because we don't have access um, to all these designs in one technology at the same time. Additionally, if we step down even deeper into this process, one of the things that we'll find is that, in point of fact, there is no module design uh, step being done. We have uh, pretty much an integration step where we just design all the chips individually and then they magically come together uh, at the layout. Uh, rather than designing the interconnects um, going from those chips to the module or any actual structures, let's say we have some 3D integrated um, filtering or, or couplers on the module level, rather than designing these purely as an analysis step using EM, we would really like to have a design step here before we get into the formal module layout uh, so that we can design those structures and uh, and optimize them parametrically rather than uh, just throwing them into an EM analysis. Um, and what this leads to is uh, an awful lot of EM trying to capture not only the properties or the performance of those structures which we want to design on the module, but also the interaction uh, among the die just in their uh, various interconnects as well as how they're being connected on the module. So in this traditional module design flow, one of the problems we see is that we have too much EM too late in the design flow with, with really too little insight into what's going on when we put these things into the into the module or, or when we're actually building and designing the module. And ultimately, ultimately this leads to too many design iterations and um, 
uh, poor performance and uh, somewhat reduced um, uh, specification. Uh, one of the underliers in, in, this, uh, in this issue is the fact that in traditional EDA flows, those tools that we're using, the, the four or five tools that get involved here, um, those tools really have separate databases for every view of the design. Well, what do we mean by a view? Well, a view is nothing more than the way that the user interacts with the design in that step. So when we're doing simulation, a traditional view of simulation might be uh, the schematic. And we manipulate the schematic. And when we go to simulate, that creates a net list, which is essentially another database, which gets right into the simulator, which creates its own internal representation, which is yet another database, which runs and creates a set of uh, data files for the output, which is yet another database, which needs to be read into some analysis or viewing engine, which is yet another database. And when we throw in um, layout on top of this and any kind of verification, and then EM analysis, we can see how these multiple databases, all representing different views of the design, really don't talk to each other at all. And layers and layers of software are written on top of this to make it look like there's um, an automated flow, if you will. But in point of fact, we're talking about multiple databases. And this approach uh, may work when we're trying to design, let's say, a chip or a board. But when we bring together multiple technologies, this falls apart very quickly, because not only do we need to manage the databases for an individual part of that module, but we need to somehow magically bring all those databases together for the entire module. And this just doesn't happen with uh, tools cobbled together to build a flow in this traditional manner. In contrast, AWR has a totally different approach. Uh, you may have viewed uh, a previous video on the unified data model. I'll just mention it briefly here. But effectively, AWR's approach is to take all of those databases and combine them into one data model from which all the views of the design uh, can access. So when we reach down into that data model through this schematic capture, for example, we're literally manipulating the same data model that the layout is reading or that the simulator is reading or that the analysis engines are reading. So those changes that we make through the schematic can ripple through the entire design automatically, and we're ensured that our design stays synchronized throughout the entire flow. Moreover, the AWR design environment is uniquely architected so that we can load multiple technologies simultaneously. And in a later video, we'll go through exactly what this looks like. But literally, you can load the entire uh, process design kit for an HBT and for a PHEMT, and for your uh, silicon RFIC, and for your packaging, and your module, and your PCB, so that simultaneously you can not only co-simulate each one of those with their unique electrical models, but you can also lay them out, because all the information necessary to represent those parts in a 2.5D or 3D layout environment are represented right there in those design kits. And we can make trade-offs in the sizing of these things without having to resort to um, artificial uh, rep cells or, or die cells that uh, are just snapshots of our, uh, of our ICs as we try to go and manage uh, the layout and the constraints that we have uh, at the module level uh, layout. So some examples of this are um, an LTCC process where we have an embedded uh, gallium arsenide LNA. Here we're able to co-design not only the um, uh, integrated passives, uh, true 3D structures built into the LTCC, but we can also make trade-offs as to what structures are going to go on the LNA and what structures we want to keep on the LTCC, thereby optimizing uh, not only space, but also performance um, and cost. Uh, another uh, perhaps uh, uh, more familiar example to some of you may be a dual band PA module where we have uh, several PA chips that reside on the module, um, but then also that whole module is put into a test board with SMA connectors so we can simulate uh, and design not only the individual die, but we could ripple that whole design up through the system to see and anticipate what it will look like when we actually try to go and test this thing. Um, if you'd like more information about what you've seen here, go to awrcorp.com or contact your AWR sales professional.